I got to give a big thanks to my buddy Jimmy DeResta. He's uh, he sent me a care package here, and uh, there was one item here that he was actually helping me with, and that was making a uh, a really nice 3D print that I plan on using for some uh, metal casting coming up pretty soon. I'm going to be uh, getting together with a few of the guys, a couple of the YouTube guys and uh, Clark Easterling, and we're going to be doing some practicing. Clark's going to be showing us how to do some metal casting, you know, including uh, you know, making the, the sand mold and then uh, pouring, pouring the iron. So uh, Jimmy was helping me with a print right here, and this is his right here. i got to do a little bit of cleaning around the edges, maybe sanding it a little bit smoother around the sides to get rid of the, uh, you know, the fuzz in there. But these look great, Jimmy. I really appreciate it. I believe this was his first one right there. This was his first print. A little bit more squared off on the uh, the anvil portion of the mic. So I believe this is the one that we're going to end up using for the uh, for the sand mold. And then uh, I didn't expect this. So this is some of the items that he's been um, making over his shop. So he built me this really cool knife. That is just awesome. He's obviously got the uh, proper knife grinder over there set up at his shop he's got a razor sharp edge on that i really love this this grind there as well beautiful knife jimmy and then he's big into these these uh a bomb size uh <laughs> razor razor knives right here razor blades that he makes so he's got it sharpened there as well sharpened up on his uh on his knife grinder so just cool stuff jimmy and of course, his uh, he, he's big into the printing press stuff. He's got the old, you know, 1800 style printing presses over there at his shop that he restores and uses. So this is like some of the stuff that he that he makes on his printing press. So got one of his uh, signatures there, and just some extras there as well. So awesome stuff. Thanks, Jimmy. I really appreciate it, man. These are awesome gifts. I've been doing a little bit of organizing in here in the shop, moving some stuff around. So I'm getting ready to. Uh, do a little work here on the shaper. I thought I would point something out and go ahead and share this a little bit with you. Ever since I started using the shaper, and anytime I show some uh, close-up shots here of the work being done, you can usually see the shaper trying to move slightly, just up and down. And a lot of people mistake that, thinking that the vise is moving or the table itself is moving under the load of the cut. When in fact, what's going on here, and, it's, and this has been going on since I set the thing up, I, I set the uh, machine on these two two by tens down on the bottom and I'm on I'm almost hundred percent positive that's what's been going on this entire time is that the base the whole machine itself is rocking back and forth as the ram is moving as it moves back the machine kind of slightly rocks back a little bit and then as it comes forward it rocks forward so it's not sitting flat on those boards down there so there's a high spot in the middle somewhere in the machine so it's just slightly rocking not a lot but just enough whenever i'm up here showing this thing cutting you can see it moving just a little bit so my goal today is to actually remove it from the boards and take those out and not sure yet how i'm going to do it but what i may do is just go ahead and cut them so that we have a board going across the front here there's actually pads here on the, on the corners and in the middle. So we may have one in the, in the very front and then have one just in the very back and not have any boards there in the middle because I don't, I don't think I wanna set it flat down on the concrete. I don't think that's gonna really do it any favors there as well. So these machines are actually designed to be lagged down and that's what these holes are for right there. You know, whenever they engineered these you're supposed to set them down onto the uh, concrete, get them level, grout them in, and then have the studs there to where it holds it in place. And that's actually the proper way to do these big heavy machines so that you can use them to the full potential that they were designed to. So if you run this thing in a high speed in a long stroke, that thing is gonna be just jerking back and forth and moving around on the foundation. So that's another reason why you, you really need to lag them down if you're gonna use them for heavy duty use. But for what we're doing, we don't really need to do that. All right, so I got a little toe jack that we'll use and I'll, get, I'll share with you how I get this thing down on the ground. This is that little toe jack that I bought back when I got the shaper. Uh, just a little cheap import tool that I got off of eBay. I think they're around like 125, 150 bucks. Well worth the, the investment to have around here if you're picking these heavy machines up. All right, 
So the plan is to do just this. That's why I got these boards cut out in the middle to clear that toe jack. And I'm just going to tilt it up on this side here and then see if I can slide that 2 by I think it's a 2 by 10 out from underneath it. Make sure I got that thing locked good. And then I got some wooden wedges down here that I'll put underneath there to kind of keep it up some. Let's see if we can that'll move. Yeah, that'll move. So, go ahead and get her pulled out. wedges here this is what we're going to use up on the corners just to kind of keep it elevated because I'm, I'm still um, undecided on if I'm going to use that tube of 10 or get a different board I may have a different board that I'm that I'm going to use here but that'll help keep it up off the ground just a little bit side. Alright, I think that one's loose. To get that thing out we'll check out the footprint because I can definitely tell where it was sitting heavy in the middle and not touching on the very ends of the boards interesting The machine is on all four of the uh, wooden wedges there. Let's go take a look at our footprint on the, uh, the tuba tins. So here's the telltale signs that my theory of the rocking machine I believe to be correct. So I, I got them laid there just like they were underneath the machine. So you can see the uh, where the edge of the base was lined up there down the side of the board. But it's only in the center and on the ends it's not touching there. Now there's some touching right there. But I believe that's as the machine was rocking forward, it was touching there, and then the oil of the machine's getting down there on it. So sitting really heavy in the middle, really not any touching in the back right there at all. And on this other board, it's touching very heavy there, right there in just the middle of it. So I believe we had a rocking machine. That's interesting. I knew it was going on, I just was trying to, you know, delicate some, uh, some time to actually get this corrected. And I'm thinking about putting some larger timbers underneath just uh, just on the ends Just to help actually kind of raise it up a, a slight amount. I don't think I would mind uh, having you up You know a couple more inches from where it's sitting at right now These are the timbers that I have that I believe I'm going to use on both ends We'll get them cut to the proper width of the base there and I want to try uh, setting this uh, setting these on on each end of the machine and we'll do that 
and use the machine again and monitor it and see if it actually helps correct the problem. I just, I, don't, I want it up off the ground. This adds a little bit of cushion there to kind of conform with the concrete and it also serves as a little bit of a riser. So it'll, it'll be up just a little bit more than what we have, which is what I want to do. All right, that's just a, that's a board that I had purchased back when I moved the, uh, the uh, Smith & Mill shaper. So they've just been kind of sitting on my trailer. We'll put them to use and see if that'll work. Boards cut. I'm gonna go ahead and get this thing picked up. My thoughts was to maybe. Uh, all right, we're gonna put one on the front, one on the back, right towards the end. And I'm gonna use the machine. I'm gonna see if it still tries to move around. If it's uh, still causing me problems, we may, we might go and try a three-point contact where maybe there's one block up here in the front, and then one across the back back there. wedges are in here and with where I want to put this thing. quarter inch on each side. Alright, we'll go to the back and do the same. right there okay I squared up that that timber on the front there so next phase is to really just uh, get the machine running I'm gonna run it in some I'm gonna do some indicating on it to uh, see if I can tell if it's still moving and shaking around and uh, I've also got a work piece that I want to get in there, a piece of material that I, I want to cut flat in the shaper. So that'll be the first test job of it anyway. We'll get it in there and start making some cuts, monitor it and see what it's doing. But I'm real happy with it. I like it being up higher like this, uh, just a little bit higher up here to work the controls. And the other thing that you can do as well by having it up on blocks is now I can get the pallet jack up underneath there if I need to move it around. You can put two pallet jacks underneath the machine this size and easily move it around a little bit if you want to. Well, we got the shaper running. I've got it stroking. That's around uh, 15, 18 inches or so, but you can see that you still got a little bit of movement on the base. Looks like we've got a total of three, maybe four thousandths total of rock. And that's whenever the ram retracts and returns, goes back into the column, is um, whenever it's actually on the high right there so it's trying to pick the front end up so this is the way I've got this machine setting is not the way that you should uh, support this machine but it's the way that I'm trying to get it set right now I may try one of those shorter boards here in the, the center of it and actually put it on three points we'll leave the one on the back and put a short one here and see if that actually makes any difference there on the uh, on the reading
other issue that we have, you know, regarding this whole situation here is, uh, you know, my concrete. I don't know how flat this concrete is, and I can tell you it's not flat at all. It's always been a very, uh, you know, just piss poor concrete job that whoever did it. Certainly reduced the uh, amount of movement it's got by half, but, uh, you yeah, know, we're still going to have a little movement in this machine without it being anchored in any way. I'm going to go ahead and run the machine like it is and uh, just kind of monitor it. But we're miles ahead of what I was. I had checked this before, but I never did show it on video. But I had a lot of movement in that needle when we had it laying flat on the boards before. So now that we got our shaper repositioned the way I want, we're going to run it like that. We'll go ahead and start on that next piece that I was telling you that I want to cut here. So <clears throat> this, is the, this is the piece of material that we're going to cut. It's a one inch by a three inch hot roll flat bar. And I want to just get it cut to where it's uh, at least flat on top and bottom. But we'll go ahead and do the sides too because these are never square. And uh, so what I'm going to do, let me take you down here to the mill and I'll show you the project that this is going to be for. We're going to have to have another video to complete this uh, project here. But we'll go ahead and use the shaper to get this cut in. So you see I got the steady rest there and what I want to do is build a support to hold this steady rest for the Victor Lade. I've got a long shaft job coming up that I got to do for somebody. It's a hundred and it's about 191 inches. And what I want to do is uh, run it out the uh, back of the lathe right here. And I've done this before in the past. And when I was at motion, I showed the uh, pedestal and I was using the steady rest there off the Acura. And I had a pedestal where you could bolt it down to the floor in different locations depending on how long the shaft is. But in this case, what we're going to do is just modify this steady rest for the Victor and just mount it to the Dual milling machine right there. And that'll that'll create a nice support. I've also got a spider, a collar that goes on the back. Let me show you that right there. That's this guy. Made this a long time ago. And this just slips up onto the back of the uh, spindle right there, lock it with set screws. So you end up having three points of contact. You have your chuck, the spider, you indicate it here running true, and then you have another outboard support, such as the steady rest, supporting the long end of the shaft so you don't have to worry about it whipping around. All right. This was a drop piece of material that I just had here, and I really wish that it was a little bit longer because I would like it to bolt all the way across the table there but I'm gonna have to uh, bolt it about like that. So we will use those two slots, those two outer slots, and our, you know, just our standard uh, T-bolts or hold, hold down stud to bolt this plate in. And then this, the steady rest, I'm gonna have it machined so that the steady rest will be sitting out here like so, towards the end of the plate. All right, we'll have it where it bolts in. Probably have some kind of little V there for this to line up on. And then it'll it'll be sitting about like this right here. Let me pull it out. So just about like that. And then we can position that anywhere on the table that we want to. And I think that's going to work out pretty nice. So we'll go ahead and start with this plate and go ahead and get it cut on the shaper anyway. And uh, at least get that part of it done. We got our work piece set up, ready to make our cut on that side. We're just going to square up this side, flip it over cut the other and then we'll surface both the top and the bottom I've got this machine set at running uh, let's see where we're at we're at 28 strokes a minute one of the problems that I have with this machine the uh, the transmission right here is depending on how much stroke I'm running right now we're running 18 strokes if I run a, a higher gear such as this case I, I did have it in 41 I, the the transmission jumps out of gear so this lever right here is either down or it's up and so if it's in the up position and this thing starts stroking it only takes about two it actually pulls this transmission you know this lever down into the neutral position so there's a there is an issue with the uh the shafts here and the gears that's causing this thing not to stay in gear and it's been doing this since i bought it it just needs to be gone into but if i run the lower speeds it does just fine, I have no problem with it. And that's usually why I'm running the lower speeds whenever I'm taking the longer strokes there. So I just wanted to point that out. So we are ready to roll. All right, we're gonna engage our feed. I've got to set it 40 thousandths 
per stroke. That's a 60,000th step of cut. So far, it seems like the machine's doing better. We're not doing our rocking business that we were before. That was just that, that cut on the very back end right there. So that's a quick rough cut right there. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, take a, a finish cut on that to smooth this side out a little bit, and then we'll flip it over. This is our finish pass. So it's a 10,000th depth of cut, and then I slow the feed rate down to 20. You can do your rough passes and get the bulk of the material removed really fast, and then change your feed and depth, and it'll make a nice finish on there. Put it over here in the stair vise and just do a very quick deburr using a coarse file there. Get rid of that sharp edge off of it. Got a nice finish. Flip it upside down in there and uh, do that side next. All right, getting our wide sides cut in now. We're just gonna do one, one pass across each side there just to clean it up, get it good and flat. So I did take my uh, two to three mics and mic both ends of that. I was a half of a thousandth being uh, out of parallel on both sides being cut. So right on par with what we use to cut here on the shaper. This is always a uh, fun and interesting way to cut in some steel like this. I usually get lots of people that make comments about why not use a mill machine or why not use the KT or whatever. Why not use an end mill? You know, this is my machine that I invested in. I love it. I love running it. I like using it. And I'm not in a hurry. This is not a job that I'm trying to push out the door and get done quickly to uh, work on the next job. I just take my time and work on the projects that I want and I like using my old vintage machines that one end didn't clean up all the way but that's okay that's not gonna hurt anything so we got one more side to cut there got everything clean and deburred make sure that my uh, parallels here are clean get her tightened up tap it down and we'll go ahead and make our last cut I will point out that I believe the machine is much more stable after uh, getting it off those big flat boards like that so I know that it's not perfect in no means by any means but uh, it is a lot more stable because I'm so used to running it for the past couple of years I could always just put my hand on it and feel it moving. I could physically see it moving. And now it seems very stable. Those few thousands that it's vibrating around, you really can't see that very good with the eye. But it's doing good. I like it. So we finished up our last cut right there. I'm going to show you a real nice way to clean that off. See all that, all this smut on here? This is cutting oil and mill scale mixed together is what that is. And often whenever you go to wipe it right here, it just kind of smears 
but um, what I like to do is just get rid of the bulk of the chips off the jaw so they don't fall down in there. Go ahead and loosen her up. And I'll show you what I like to do in between cuts like this. This works really well. Come back here to the smart washer and just wash it off. Just use the cleaner and the brush to get rid of all that oil and the mill scale off of it. It's funny, actually, it didn't actually clean it all the way up, or is it just stuck down in there? Yeah, it's just. It stuck down in those uh, those cut grooves in there, but that always works good, especially like when you're filing. Also, you go to file all the edges, you got all those little burrs all over it. You just take it back here and just give it a real quick rinse in the smart washer. It works great. I figured we could go ahead and square off the two ends there. We'll do that in the KT. Ready to make a cut here. See if some cutting oil actually helps it this time. Seem to do better with the cutting oil there. The other side, the chips were coming around and just being pulled into the cut there, making little marks on it. And that one is nice and smooth there show you the difference that one and then we got our, our other side right there this is what I do whenever I try to protect the uh, metal surfaces I've got my CRC SP 300 rust inhibitor this is a non-drying uh, rust inhibitor there keep it in my sure shot and I just dust it over the uh, the bare metal whenever I'm done as you could see earlier I've got my doors open because we we've, we've had really nice weather but there is uh, moisture starting to move in now. We're gonna have some rain coming in this week and I can already feel the difference in the humidity in the air. So if I continue to work like this and leave the doors open, eventually the uh, bare metal is gonna start trying to flash rust. So you can see it, I got it on the uh, six jaw chuck here and the same thing over here on the, uh, the Monarch. I went ahead and sprayed this chuck down, put a little bit on the machine itself too, but there's a lot of things that work really well, but this is what I have from CRC and it does a good job. And that's what I use to try to keep my uh, clean, polished and ground metals from uh, flash rusting. So anyway, here's our uh, finished block right here, or at least shaped, you know, cut to size. We still got more to do, but we're gonna have to uh, get to another video to finish that out. What we'll do is we'll uh, we'll just set up here in the do wall and drill our two holes so that it'll It'll bolt there in those two slots and hang out just about like that. Have a uh, maybe a stud or something right here. Not quite sure how I want to uh, fix it to this plate. But anyway, we'll have something here to bolt it down and probably mill us a uh, little channel to, right there and put some kind of some kind of V or a piece of angle or whatever to uh, match up with the, the V on the, uh, the steady rest there. All right. So we'll get back to it and uh, we'll get it finished out on the next video well i've got a nice update for you i've been steadily working the past couple days trying to get all of my electrical issues taken care of and i'm here to say that i finally got near everything done and i've been waiting for a long time for this but i'm finally i can tell you now that i have my flex arm finally powered up ready to go I've got a dedicated circuit. We've got the transformer hooked up. 
I've got a dedicated circuit over here that I can plug this power unit into and get it turned on. So the flex arm is ready to go. We've also got some other electrical issues that we've done too. So let me show you what we got. Now I showed this before, this is the high voltage or 480, 480 volt transformer that uh, Jonathan DeWitt gave me as well as some other electrical components like this disconnect right here. Uh, he gave me actually uh, three disconnects, a high voltage panel and the transformer to get hooked up and I finally got all this hooked up there. So I've got three new circuits installed and so I've got a 100 amp breaker inside the panel there that is running the transformer. So anytime I want to use this and the only time this is going to be used is whenever I use the flex arm. I've just got the one circuit going right now but we can certainly tap into it and uh, add more if we need to. So I've got transformer right here. We can turn it on. Maybe you can hear it going. It's got a little slight hum to it. And then feeding out of the transformer, we've got our 30 amp, this is a 30 amp uh, disconnect. Turn that sucker on and this is gonna run the circuit that is powering up the flex arm right there, okay? So I've got it plugged into the wall. We've just got a dedicated circuit run around there and you can see it right there behind the grinder. All right, got it plugged in. So this guy is ready to go. So let's show you, let's show you um, it running. Pull the panel out there. All right, so let me bring this over here and take a look at it. We are in gear one. All right, let's see if it'll settle out right there. Gear one. Validation. Hit start. All right, so. That powered up the power unit there. So you got forward and reverse. So you can control the speed with these guys right here forward and reverse that controls your speed so you've also got high and low gear or gear one and two and you can change that out right there so you've got like a low range and a high range so this guy's ready to go it is just about ready to do some tapping unfortunately <laughs> unfortunately i was just going through all of the tools and i discovered that one of the adapters is missing from my toolkit here uh, you know, when I brought this home, I had no need to unpackage all these. These were all in plastic bags, well oiled, and uh, just now took, taking them all out. So you've got four different sizes that go to this particular flex arm right here. And so if I want to use this size right here, I believe this is a two, a size number two. I do not have the proper adapter to go from a two to a four, which is this size right there. So. I already called uh, the guys at Flex Arm, and we've got an order in for the proper adapter. And then the other tool that I'm missing as well is the magnetic alignment tool. So there is a tool that just basically looks like this, except it's got a magnet in the bottom. You put this in the spindle, and that's how you actually square this up to your table or your workpiece, wherever you're going. So you stick the magnetic tool in there, and you'll come down to the table and square this thing up and then tighten it up and get it nice and nice and square so i'm gonna wait because they've got those those guys in the mail for the uh, magnetic and trying to move a little bit on me so we need the magnetic alignment tool and also need my other adapter but we can use it for some other tapping there as well but since i just got it powered up i don't have anything ready to tap i'm also going to need to do a modification for my vice here I'm going to probably drill and tap a couple holes up here to be able to utilize this big vise up here on the table. All right, so let's go ahead and shut her off. Just stop it right there. And that's it. And then whenever I'm not using it, I'm just going to take my cord, unplug it, wrap it up, and put it over here behind the unit. All right. So that's the first update. We got the flex arm ready to go. So the second... I will mention that we've got our Oliver drill grinder 
hooked up and, and ready to go. I've got this circuit here that it's plugged into. I had to rewire, rewire this and add a breaker over to the panel for the Oliver and we've got it ready to go. Now I have played with it. We'll, uh, we'll turn it on and let you see. I've got to, I've got to read the manual on uh, the proper way to operate this machine. And uh, so I got to pull that up. I've got a PDF on it and figure this machine out. I did go in there and play with it and I've got a grind on this drill right there, but it is not right. So I did not do it correctly, but it is looking pretty good. So let's go ahead and uh, there's a couple issues with this. Whenever you engage this gearbox here with this lever, sometimes it doesn't want to engage and turn everything on. So not quite sure what that's about. All right, and then um, Andrew had put this belt on the machine and I believe that the, the metal lacing or something that's kind of tapping this guard right here. So there's that that's got to deal with. And I think there may be a knock in the motor. I'm not really sure, but let's go ahead and turn it on. bad but definitely doesn't sound super smooth so we'll go ahead and engage it let's see if it engages for me see sometimes it doesn't want to engage it takes there it goes that's the knocking i'm talking about so i got to just pull this out and find out what's happening I think it's that belt. Not quite sure yet. That's it. That disengages it. Yeah, something's going on with the gearbox there. But we know we got a good machine. We just got to figure out a couple things that's going on with it. And I've got to learn how to properly operate the thing so I can get a good grind on my drill bits there. All right. So there's the second update. We got our Oliver going. All right. And then, of course, we moved my uh, hardness tester over here. So that's the only place left I really got to put it. So it is right there. All right, let me bring you around here to the uh, addition side, and I'll show you what we've done over here. So I've got three places right here along the wall. I've got a brand new three-phase circuit over here, and we've got the electric Kentmore press hooked up. It's running into its own disconnect there. We've got a brand new switch on it. All right, this, this disconnect is for that receptacle and that's gonna be for the Davis key seater, this guy right here. But we're actually, the plan is to run the other Davis key seater, uh, not this one right there. But I also wanted to plug, just so I could plug it in and also if there's something else that comes in there that I wanna be able to plug in, I could maybe just use that receptacle there. All right, this disconnect here is going to be for the queen city pedestal grinder which is exactly on the other side of the wall right now i'm going to bring that around here and we're going to hardwire it into the disconnect so that i have all of my grinders an exception of the oliver over here in this side right up in here all right so really excited to see that happen here is the electric press operating It's a little more noisy in here than what I remember. Used to always sit outside and then I ended up buying it back from, um, from Motion whenever they got the Dake Press. And uh, you know, it was in a big shop, so it, it just wasn't quite as noisy in there. But this is an excellent press for broaching keyways right here. Uh, this was originally my dad's and then we downsized. He actually sold it to Motion and I used it there for a long time. And then they ended up selling it back to me. So now it's back, back at Booth Machine Shop. All right, 
So one more thing that we'll mention before we go, the other key, Davis key seater, that's this guy right here. This is the one that I bought from uh, my buddy Lance. So I went ahead and wired it up. He gave me this switch right here. That was the old switch that was on it and it was missing the cover. Lance had this one that he pulled off another machine. So I wired it up, we put a cord on it, we've got a plug on it and I took it over there and plugged it in right there where the Oliver's at. And I think something's wrong with it because all it did was hum. So I couldn't get any, I couldn't get any movement or rotation out of it. So that's telling me that something is wrong and we don't know what it is. You know, either it's locked up or the motor or the motor's locked up. I'm not sure yet. So I just let it go. And uh, it sounds like we're gonna have to uh, probably go into this thing a lot deeper, probably just take the whole thing apart. So there's, there's something going on with it. I did check it, check the motor and it says that it's uh, 220 voltage right there. So um, it shouldn't be wired up for high voltage just because I checked the tag there. So we're gonna have to get to this one another time, possibly even have to wire up that other Davis in the meantime, if I wanna do some um, key cutting with it. All right, so new transformers hooked up. We got our new high, high voltage circuit. Flex arm is ready to go. Just gonna wait on my uh, other tooling that I need. And in the meantime, we will uh, see about getting the vise situated and mounted where I want to. And I'll be uh, getting some things ready so that we can actually finally start putting this thing to the test. I do need to buy some taps for this machine as well. I don't have, but just maybe a handful of these, um, you know, spiral fluted type taps, which is great for what, if you're gonna bottom tap. So I need to up my tap game and uh, get a little inventory of the proper tap for this thing as well. But really excited to see all this stuff coming together. Finally got all my machines ready to go. So that's it. That was the update for this week. Hope you guys enjoyed and we will see you on the next video, okay?